All right. Hello and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you from beautiful blue skied San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by Tom Pacello, who is on the far coast and he's in Orlando, Florida. Another beautiful, I'm sure, blue skied place right now. Right, Tom? You got it, John. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And Tom is a thought leader and author on sales and marketing effectiveness, as well as a serial entrepreneur, well known for his videos, blog posts and newsletter, The ROI Guy. Great name. Great name, Tom. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about from pitch to purpose. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about, okay, pitch to purpose. So they both sound almost uh, two different things completely, right? Pitch and Absolutely. purpose. Absolutely. So, you know, normally what we find is that too often sellers are still pitching their products. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny as we, a lot of us have moved to remote selling and online meetings and virtual yeah. meetings. This has actually been exacerbated. I've sat in on quite a few sales calls recently, internal customers. And what I found is that because it's an online meeting and normally if you're in person, there tends to be more interaction, more collaboration. I've seen it actually move the opposite way, where now it's more PowerPoint goes up, the seller starts you know, pitching right to the linear PowerPoint, and it's almost more of a sales pitch than ever. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, buyers couldn't be more put off by a traditional pitch and approach, right? So yeah. we have to remind ourselves that we still have to make the meetings very collaborative, to ask more questions, to speak less, and not to get enamored with a sharing of a presentation or sharing of a demo, showing off every feature in the demo and pitching every um, you know, possible um, use case and feature. And the same thing, don't pop up a linear presentation and just pitch to it. Yeah, well, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head there that the problem here is that when people start to sell remotely or virtually, they start to think they're in a broadcast mode as opposed to a collaborative mode. Like if they were in front of the people, they'd say, oh, I see Tom. Tom kind of paused on that. So let me interact mm -hmm. with Tom. But because they're doing it virtually, they forget all of these interactive elements and the collaboration and they go into broadcast mode. Absolutely. And you can't jump up at a whiteboard or one of my... Yeah favorite techniques and a couple of um, people have recommended, you know, hand them a marker and the both of you yeah. are co-collaborating on a solution. That stuff just, it's very difficult to do in a remote meeting. So the first thing is, is get the videos on, right? Just like mm -hmm. we're doing here in this yeah. session, you know, make sure you can see the person. Body language is still important. Make sure you're pausing a lot, asking a lot of questions. Don't forget about what I call is kind of DPF as the best strategy. Diagnose, then prescribe then facilitate. And so making sure you're still asking a lot of questions and not just being a wind up toy when it comes to pitching, you know, and, and just wind them up and let them go. That's not appropriate in this environment. And you, you asked the other question, John, which is what is purpose? So I think we all know what pitching is and that it's not good. Yeah. Pur purpose is the why of why they invited us there in the first place and making sure we're paying attention to the purpose that we have. And that ultimately is not to sell a solution, but it's to help the prospect solve a challenge mm -hmm. or an issue they have, and ultimately to deliver value in doing that. So it's yeah. focusing on the buyer challenges and issues on one side, and then ultimately the outcome that they need and the problem that we're solving and the value, the business value, ultimately we can deliver. Yeah. And I just want to reinforce a couple of things that you said there. Number one, the thing about the camera is is really critically important. And it's amazing that there are still a lot of salespeople who will, you know, charge into a room and own it or but they but when it comes to turning on their webcam, oh, I don't know, I, I don't feel good on camera and all of that. You have to just get over it. And then my, my advice, my advice nowadays is pretty just straightforward, like get over it. Right. Yeah. Because you got to put a face to the name. And also, like you said, uh, on the diagnosis, you know, what's a prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. So make sure you're spending a good amount of time. And even if you're using visual slides to help mm -hmm. support, you know, don't read off of them, have it be interactive and leverage slides that are going to get you to a diagnosis, not a prescription. 
Mm-hmm. So don't go into your demo right away. Don't go into your prescriptive PowerPoint right away. Make sure you're doing that diagnosis so that you know what the buyer's business objectives are, what their challenges are. You can come in with a point of view on those to get mm-hmm. the conversation yeah. started. So it's not like you can't start with a PowerPoint, but just don't rely on it. And, and make sure that you're asking as many questions to counter everything that you're presenting on. Yeah, and I think of your 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 point about the purpose, and the purpose is to help and, and serve, if you like. That that often, unfortunately, gets kind of forgotten, as you say. Particularly if somebody gets into pitching or presentation mode, they forget the fact that um, they're there to help. And to help, you have to understand what the person needs help with. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And too often, you know, online as well as in person, particularly with demos. So let's go beyond PowerPoint. Yeah. You're, you're, sure. you're ready to give a demo. You're proud of your solution. You're ready mm-hmm. to demonstrate it. And we've seen it where the demonstrations tend to be very long. Uh, they yeah. tend to go through every feature and function mm-hmm. that the tool can do in one kind of set way. And yeah. instead, I say, break it up into little stories and make those stories around the use cases that then tie back to the challenges and issues that you discovered in the first part of your interaction with the customer, make them very pointed. Showing off every feature and function adds complexity. And when people have complexity, when they've got to make a decision, it freezes them in place. Mm -hmm. It's a a neuroscience um, issue called overchoice. And when something is perceived as complex or there's so many features to choose from, simplicity is actually vast. And so- Mind people are about that in their online experience as well. Yeah, no, you're you're 100. percent It's like I mean, I would say if you presented somebody with three doors in front of them, they will choose eventually. They choose a door. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you give them eight doors, they won't choose any of them. Exactly, because they'd be paralyzed paralyzed by choice, as you said. Um, and I think it's a it's a it's a great point to underline is. So when you're doing your discovery at the at the beginning or even pre-call and you're making sure that you understand what their needs are, you number one, you need to validate those needs again and make sure they're correct. And then, as you said, you need to tie them to what you're demoing as opposed to demo everything and hope you hit what they're looking for. Exactly. Everything needs to always tie back to those mm-hmm. objectives, the business objectives that the buyer has. Their challenges that they're looking to solve, their business challenges, and also their personal challenges. The demo gets tied to that. The presentation gets tied to it. And then the business value, the outcomes that you're looking to deliver also need to get tied to that. So don't forget about that. And John, I want to emphasize that a little bit more as we're talking, because this is another issue that everyone is going to face. Budgets are going to tighten up as a Mm -hmm. result of this. Businesses are going to change. And they're going to be forced to cut back on spending, do more with less. There are going to be spending embargoes that might continue for the rest of 2020, maybe even into early next year for certain businesses. How are you going to overcome that? And you can't overcome that with just a communication of value. You actually have to, and here's the ROI guy talking, right? You actually have to quantify the value Mm -hmm. that you're going to deliver. If you want that proposal to break through the embargo or be at the top of the stack when spending does get reinitiated, You've got to have a business case and you've got to deliver it proactively, the financial justification that your champion is going to use with the CFO. If you're not delivering a business case with every proposal, I think you're going to miss out when the embargoes are lifted and you won't be able to break through any proposal to get approved at this point Mm -hmm. in time. Buyers are not going to ask for it too, John, which is the other thing. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you need to deliver this proactively. So business objectives, and discovery around challenges, arm your presentation and your proposals and your demos at those challenges and make sure they're aligned to it. And then quantify the business value proactively on every deal if you're going to stand a chance to get those deals through. And we know there's there are going to be winners through this process. Yeah. Oh, and for sure. Absolutely. And I think there's great opportunity, in fact, for many, many businesses to be true problem solvers through this time to help businesses reinvent themselves but you've got to have those three elements in place to win. Absolutely. And I think uh, just to, just to underline what you were saying there about you have to arm, arm your, your buyer with the information and the ROI is uh, I remember I will, and this is what's going to happen again, but I recall after the financial crisis, there was a company I was running and we had one of our customers, we had a, a, a division of, of one of the largest companies in the world. Right. So, and, 
normally the VP could sign off on on the on the purchase right, right there. That had to go all the way back to a country in Asia to this to the senior management of that wow. household name company because everything had to go up to be signed off, right? That kind yeah. of thing's going to happen again. So to your point, if you're not arming your buy, the thing is they may not they may have to run it up the chain. And they may have to run up the chain further than they ever did before. And if you don't have the financial justification, they're going to get through. Yeah. And in that financial justification, quantification is important because the the bean counters, the CFOs, the CEOs will be looking at that. But here's another element. Don't forget the story. Because your champion might know the story of the business objectives you're helping to solve, the issues, what it's costing them to do nothing, what evidence that you can actually deliver this. All of those are elements. We like to use clothes, challenge, loss, opportunity, solution, and evidence as a storyteller's arc to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Make sure your story is included because the CEO is not going to understand what the numbers mean. So you need the numbers, but the numbers have to be put into context of this story and everything has to tie back to their big business objectives, which is what those executives care about. And you're so right. I could remember selling into uh, HPE and I would get the proposal back that we sent in and Mark Hurd signed off on it or (laughs) or Larry Ellison at Oracle would sign off on it. It was going up to that level. Mm -hmm. And these were purchases that were $50,000, $75,000, $50,000, yeah, 75000 yeah. things that you wouldn't think would go up to a Larry Ellison. We're yeah. going up to his level. And so you have to have those, those, that story and that evidence in place and that financial justification to get it approved. Yeah, and I love the fact that you mentioned the story thing too, because I think that's really important because I guarantee you that at every level your proposal goes through, uh, somebody is going to say to your buyer, do we really need to do this now? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And how far do you think a product pitch will go as no. opposed to something with purpose, right? Getting back to that pitch to purpose. So it's not just our engagement in a re- you know, remote selling environment mm-hmm. that needs this. It's the entire cycle needs to yeah. move from pitch to purpose. Yeah. And, and, and as I said, just to reinforce what we're talking about, it's really important for you to remember that there's probably going to be a lot more people involved in the buying decision and probably at least 50% of them you're never going to know about. No, exactly. And they will not know much about you. And Mm -hmm. so how do you get your mobilizer or your champion to really be able to communicate and quantify the value of your solution of Mm -hmm. that very frugal chain. I call it frugal nomics. Yeah. We're back. To yeah. Frugal nomics. Frugal nomics. That's the yeah. good one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and I do believe as well. Um, I mean, because of that, is uh, you have to. You're going to have to do a lot of research. You're going to have to be very careful, very well organized. And and the other part, I think, is the trust level you you have to build with the buyer has now, I think, just gone up again. Because they want to make sure. Okay, if I run this up the chain, and if I get sign off on this. It better work. And second off, you better be there with me. Exactly. So there is a partnership um, that you're establishing at a whole different level. Uh, you're probably going to both put skin in the game through this proposal mm-hmm. process as proposals change, right? Yeah. Um, and you've got to make sure that there are assurances in there of success. Uh, we've moved to a model where there's a no-risk engagement and we're not getting paid until you actually have um, proven the value of the solution. Right. You'll see things like ROI and total cost of ownership guarantees come back into place, which are going to mm. be hot now. Yeah. And uh, you're going to have to have skin in the game. And to get over the trust factor issues, having great success stories and being yeah. able to hold up relevant company success, I think is important as well to help alleviate uh, some of the stress. Because you're right, uh, not only is their name on the proposal, but if Larry Ellison's name is on that proposal, yeah. he's a pretty tough guy. And yeah, 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 he's going to he's going to be right. So, how did this work out? And if you're not, if you didn't, uh, if you didn't deliver, or you didn't help, or whatever. And I think that's the other part is like yeah. you got to stay. You probably got to stay engaged a little lot longer after the sale than you may would. May you may would in the normal um, uh, chain of events because you're going to need to support them and, and be there for them. 
Absolutely, John. And so I think a lot of companies, you will see what we're calling realized value or realized ROI programs get put into mm -hmm. place. It's not a matter of proving the value and, and doing kind of outcome-based approach up front. Mm -hmm. It's going in six months, a year later, and proving that you actually delivered to those original proposals. And if you haven't, figuring out with the company how the heck to get that value out of it. A lot of us, too, are selling subscription solutions mm -hmm. nowadays, too. And yeah. the selling doesn't stop up front. You have to continuously prove your value to the organization. Those companies that have customer success groups today, a lot of them are basing value on, well, here's how many licenses I sold you. Look at the good usage you're getting. Yeah, and that's yeah. okay, right? But... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usage doesn't prove outcomes to a CFO and value. And so you have to get it to be quantified value on the back end as well of all of these deals. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because yeah, it, we tend to identify a couple of metrics and say, well, everything looks like it's going well there. So don't really yeah. have to. And then, and then you get, and then somebody gets blindsided when they don't renew. You're like, but everything looked like it was going everything well. Everything looked good. You had good usage. Well, yeah, you didn't mm -hmm. prove the value to the CFO and they're cutting 20% of the providers yeah. that they have. We saw a lot of vendor consolidation right after the financial. Yeah, thing. absolutely. That's the thing that's going to happen. And how do you get yourself above that line? Well, if you're quantifying the value, who the heck is going to cut something that saved the company 2 million or 5 million? Exactly. But they might cut something that has, you know, a 40 or 50% adoption and half the licenses aren't getting used. But even yeah. though you might've been delivering four or 5 million in value on that half used license count, it, it won't matter, you'll get cut. No. Yeah, exactly. And I just, and I think also the thing that you just be careful of is that handoff to uh, customer success or account management is make that a very elegant one where the customer feels, doesn't feel like you were like, here you go, see you later, I'm off. Uh, because that's not going to be a good, that's not going to be a good impression right now. No, exactly. And, you know, if it again is why are we there for purpose for the customer mm -hmm. and everyone's yeah. got that philosophy, I think that helps a lot. Yeah, as I always say, uh, yeah, chameleons are wonderful, can be wonderful pets. I've, I know somebody who has one and it's lovely to see them change colors and things. In a salesperson, not such a good trait. Not, not turn into this, start off with this really helpful, engaged person. And the minute you sign the deal, you're like, oh, not here they anymore. They yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But listen, Tom, this has been fantastic. Uh, we're bumping up against the end of our time. All of Tom's information will be in his contributor bio and all the links so you can find out more. But please do tell people a little bit more about yourself before we go. Absolutely. So I run an organization called the Evolved Selling Institute, and that is evolvedselling.com. And there is a book available, Evolved Selling, as well to accompany that. And we're giving away free e-copies of that right now. So Thank just you. hit me up on LinkedIn or go to Evolved Selling and register for that. I'm also Chief Evangelist at Mediafly, and we develop return on investment, total cost of ownership tools, sales enablement platform, the things that you need to be to uh, implement to be effective at remote selling as well as the financial justification. Yeah, again, listen, thanks, Tom. I think this has been fantastic. A lot of really useful stuff. I really uh, would encourage you to go check out Tom and uh, check out all of the resources he has. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you off for another expert interview really soon. Thanks, John.